again. Sorry, everyone. Um, welcome to the Safe Water Advisory Group, and I'll turn it over to uh, Andrea Nico to uh, set us off here. Thank you everybody for attending the first uh, Safe Water Advisory or SWAG group uh, meeting of um, 2022. Uh, we have, if you could go to the next slide, please, Brian. Uh, we have a pretty packed agenda. We have a lot of stuff to cover, so we're, we're going to move quickly through it. But um, I just want to start with some welcome and introductions, give a little bit of a recap of the SWAG for our new members. Um, and then we have a couple presentations tonight with Q&A and then a few other updates and uh, discussions about future goals and uh, drinking water forum, and then we'll end with public comments. So um, with that, I think we should just go ahead and start and do a round of introductions. We'll start with everyone in the room and then we can move to the folks on the on the Zoom. So Brian, do you want to start? Sure. Um, hello everyone here in the room. I'm Brian Getz, Deputy Director of Public Works. And, uh, Thanks for attending our first uh, SWAG meeting of, of the year. And uh, I'll turn over next to Al. Al Pratt, I'm the Water Resource Manager for the City of Portland. I'm not an official member of the SWAG, but I've been with it a lot last year and two of this year. I'm Rich Blaylock. I'm a city councilor. I'm one of the two representatives of the SWAG, and I'm happy to be here. Hi, uh, William McQuillan. I'm the Assistant Fire Chief and a member of the SWAG. I'm Vince Lombardi. I'm a city councilor and a new member. Andrea Amico. I'm a Portsmouth resident and a PFAS advocate. Okay. I think um, I will just uh, go through the the, uh, the panelists that are members of the SWAG. So we have, uh, have Hope in Epps. Are you out there, Hope? Yes, Hope Van Epps from the school board, also a resident of Portsmouth. Glad to be back. Great. Uh, Senator uh, Rebecca Perkins Quoka. Hi, everyone. Nice to be joining you. Great. Thank you. And um, as a uh, guest and promoted the panelists, are uh, Stephanie Secord, our public information officer, who's been wonderful at helping us keep on track and uh, doing minutes for us. And we also have Beverly Duran from DHHS. It looks like we do have three attendees. Um, the phone number 603-817-8366. Is that, is that Kim by chance? Okay, well, we will... Uh, uh, yes, Brian, it is, um, okay. and she couldn't unmute herself, so I will try to do that. I think I, I can have through Stephanie. Great. Oh, there we are. Okay. So, uh, Kim, Thank are you, you just audio, or do you see us visually as well? I'm afraid I'm just audio. Okay. We'll do our best. Um, everybody here in the room, if you can speak into your microphones when you're speaking. They'll help us audio-wise. Um, and uh, Kim, we'll just have to uh, um, do our best to, to walk you through what we're talking about on the, the slides, and we can catch you up later. Um, visually, as with all of our materials, we do put PDFs of all our presentations. We are recording this meeting, so we'll also have a recorded uh, document as well. So. And with that, I turn it back over to Andrea to kind of set the stage for where we're going to be um, as far as what we're going to cover in the meeting. That's great. Thank you, Brian. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I just, again, want to say welcome to our new members, um, the two new city councilors. Thank you very much for joining our group. We're really excited to have you here. Um, and just for everyone, we just wanted to do a quick recap of the SWAG from 2021. So just a couple high level items to know, the SWAG was approved by the city council in October of 2020. We established a mission to review and communicate the latest science on the health and environmental effects of drinking water contaminants with a heavy focus on PFAS to monitor federal and state level legislative changes and to anticipate policy changes that could impact the city of Portsmouth. Um, we voted last year to have two co-chairs, Brian Getz and myself, and I think that worked out well to have a city representative as well as a community representative. It's helped to kind of balance the group nicely and 
the agenda. Uh, we met five times in 2021 and we covered a variety of topics. As Brian said, there is a website for the swag. It has all of our meetings, uh, videos, PDFs of presentation. So um, if anyone's interested in seeing what we covered last year, that's certainly a good place to go. Um, we did have some changes in our membership last year. So Lindsay Carmichael is a Portsmouth resident um, and she was actually instrumental in helping to get the swag formed and she moved to Florida last year. So unfortunately we lost her membership. And then we also had Portsmouth firefighter Russell Osgood, who was also an original member of our swag. And then he retired. <laughs> and then he was replaced with Assistant Fire Chief Bill McQuillan. We've been really happy to have him too. Um, one of the very first things we did as a swag is we established an overview document, which was just kind of giving everyone the same kind of baseline level of information, which is on the swag website. And then we established some goals that we wanted to achieve last year. Um, as I said, you can see all this information on the city website. And at the end of last year, Brian and myself presented um, a report and a small presentation to the Portsmouth City Council, just reading out our meetings, uh, what we covered, and any recommendations that we had. So that kind of gives us gets us up to speed as to where we are today. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so. So the, uh, the swag it, it originally was just uh, uh, a one-year committee, but it was re-upped again this year by Mayor McEachern. So we appreciate that. And uh, perhaps uh, he may, we can invite him to a future meeting perhaps and uh, have him attend. But uh, the councilors uh, uh, appointed by the, the mayor or uh, Councilor Vince Lombardi over here and uh, Councilor Rich Blaylock over there. So thank you for joining us. Uh, the community members are uh, Andrea Katrie Hellman, who um, I think did say she was out of town, and Rich Deep and Tima, who uh, had a, a family conflict this evening. We do have one vacancy on the committee, so if people have um, people they, they think might be interested, please uh, let them know the information we can provide. It's it's also on the I believe the city's website to. Uh, just put an application in and then the mayor um, can uh, put forward any uh, recommendation there on, the, on filling that vacancy. And from the fire department, we have the assistant chief McQuillan and myself representing the water department, but my right hand, though he's on the left side, uh, Al Pratt has been to every meeting and Al is instrumental, as you'll see this evening from the information he's gonna present about our lead program. and uh, I, we, I could not get half of what I need to get accomplished uh, here with the water system without Al, so he's great. Um, Kim McNamara, our health officer, um, is on the committee as well, representing the health uh, department, Hope Van Amps, uh, from the school board, and uh, Dr. Laurel Shader uh, from Silent Spring Institute uh, is a member and has provided some great input, but she too uh, had a family. Um, it is a uh, spring break or, or winter break down in Massachusetts and she and family are out of town. Um, and then uh, on our uh, representatives from the, uh, our uh, state representative, David Muse, did not hear directly from him, but we did have some communication from him about um, information regarding legislative stuff. And then we have uh, Senator uh, Perkins Cuoco with us. So uh, those, those are the members. I did get clarity today on, um, the, uh, somehow that slide didn't didn't come through, but uh, basically we are a two-year committee. So this group um, is for the term of this council. So we go through December of uh, 31st of 2023. So we've got two-year term um, at that time, like we did um, previously at the end of our term last year, we'll likely do a report, but at the end of this year, we'll probably summarize things. Um, as to what we've done, um, there are, we are a voting committee for voting on minutes, though we don't um, have any direct policy vote. I, I think it would be more recommendations if we bring stuff to council that needs to be you know, something of a, a city policy uh, in, in those terms. And everybody on the committee that's on the committee right now um, is, is here for the term unless they elect to uh, you know, resign and, and be replaced by somebody else. So again, appreciate everybody that's with us now and hopefully through the next couple of years. 
And uh, you know that 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 is basically it. We do need to uh, last year when we gathered um, the election of co-chairs of myself and Andrew Miko was was put forward. And per um, Kelly Barnaby, our clerk, she said uh, we need to vote again for chairs this year just to make it official. So, so I'll make that motion then to uh, receive our current co-chairs to uh, co-chairs through the Second. Okay. So, everyone in favor, or do we have to go around and take a vote? I, I, I think somebody's in the chat. I don't know if that's a, oh, the website for the swag. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I think we probably, since we do have people on um, on Zoom, we probably just do a voice vote like I do for council. So, okay. um, I guess I'll abstain since I've nominated the councilor. Uh, yes. Uh, Tom yes. Uh, Vince Murray, yes. And our panelists out there in Zoom land, hope to see you now. And ups, yes. Senator, Senator Kobe, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so. Uh, Kim. Kim oh, Kim. Yeah, sorry, Kim. <laughs> she may be. Hello. All right. Is that a yes, Kim? That's a yes, sorry. All right, appreciate it. Good. All right. All right, next slide, please. All right, so that leads us into um, the presentations that we have tonight uh, on lead. And um, this, was, this was a topic that came up at the end of last year that was suggested by our city health officer as a good, um, a good thing for the Safe Water Advisory Group to take a look at. And so we're really happy to um, have with us tonight Beverly Druin. She's from the New Hampshire Division of Public Health, uh, and she's the lead on Healthy Homes and Lead Poisoning Program. Um, and she's going to start first by giving us a presentation. And then we're going to hear from um, Al Pratt from the Water Supply Operations Manager of the City of Portsmouth on lead and copper regulations and the City of Portsmouth activities. And then at the end of the two of their presentations, we're going to have some Q&A from the SWAG. So um, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Beverly to kick us off. Thank you for being here, Beverly. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Brian, did you want me to bring up my slides? Well, let's it's, see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I've, yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Let's get my screens right. So can everybody see that? We, we see your, your slide view where it's, uh, there you go, full screen. Excellent. Okay, full screen. Okay, well, I can't see you, but I think I'm in good shape. So thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. So my name again is Beverly Druin and I work at Public Health. I'm a section administrator, which means I'm a middle manager and I oversee a section of programs. Um, the Health Officer Liaison, Climate and Health and the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. Um, these are the topics that I'm going to try to cover tonight, and I know it's a lot of information in a fairly short period of time, so I will give it a whirl and give do, do my best. So the data that we're going to look at tonight and we're going to talk about, um, we just released our 2020 lead exposure data for the state, but what I have here I wanted to point out to all of you is that we have the 29 2019 lead data for Portsmouth for the public health region, which focuses on Portsmouth. Um, I'll put a link in the chat when we're done. And if you haven't looked at this data, I certainly encourage you to. It has information about testing rates, Medicaid rates, um, parts of Portsmouth that you need to focus on, uh, census data. It's really a wealth of information. Um, I. So if you look here at this map on the left here, always in public health, right, the dark is the darker is the worse, the lighter is the better, right? So you can see here on the state map, the areas in our state that we focus on for lead, Berlin, Franklin, Claremont, Newport, uh, Dover, Summersworth, Rochester, Manchester, Nashua. Within um, this pop out here has your public health uh, region, 
So you can see Portsmouth compared to the other communities in your region, but you have, obviously you have sections of Portsmouth that have extremely old housing that are a focus that there's been a lot of blood lead elevations over the last five years. And this data here is five years worth of data. We don't publish a year's worth of data because we have to mask it because New Hampshire has such small communities and we can't, we just mask data. Um, in the um, data brief for Portsmouth has a lot of census data, but there's a couple things that I really did want to point out. So New Hampshire is what we call a universal testing state. We became a universal testing state in 2018. And what that means is every child, when they go to the doctor at their first and their second year birthday, they have a blood test. So we test the children at one and we test them at two and it's the law here in New Hampshire. And so Portsmouth should have a hundred percent testing rate. So I put this arrow here to point out for one-year-olds, you're only testing 62% of your one-year-olds for blood lead elevation. And, it, and your two-year-olds, you're only testing 53%. So it should be 100, and we're, we're falling a little short there. Um, we also have 39 children in the Portsmouth, the city of Portsmouth that have an elevated blood lead level high enough that they warrant uh, nurse case management in this five-year period. Um, it's more than you want, I can tell you that much. You don't need 39 children with blood lead elevations. This slide here has some census data. The first thing I wanted to point out, I don't think it's any surprise to you that you know you have some of the oldest housing stock in New Hampshire. If not the, I think the oldest housing stock in New Hampshire. Um, lead paint was banned for residential use in 1978 census data shows what we have uh, pre-50. So the rule of thumb is, if your house is pre-78, there's a good chance that it has lead. If your house is pre-50, you can guarantee it has lead. So my house is 1830, it's held together with lead. Also in, um, it's not just housing that has the risk of, it's not just housing. So there's a lot of social vulnerability indices that add to housing. So if I live in, I mean, you people who live in Portsmouth, who live in really old homes, who are fairly wealthy and can maintain those homes. But if you add poverty and low education and a transient population and children under six and refugees, you add those layers of risk. Um, you have certain areas in your community that are very, very high risk. So you have a, a transient population in Portsmouth 5.6, that's fairly on the high side. You have a 41% of your homes are rented with children under the age of six. And you have 7.2% of your, of these children are living in poverty. So you just layer those risks on top of another and you have certain neighborhoods. I like to use the words, they're blinking. They're just flashing with risk. So how do kids get lead poisoned? Let's move this. I got something in my way here. So it's not just housing. I wish it was just housing, but it's not. So there are dozens and dozens of ways that children and adults get lead poisoned in the state of New Hampshire every day. But what I did is I, I pulled out the top 10. So we have lead paint in housing. We have people like me and my husband are doing DIY projects. We have lead in soil around the drip line of houses around interstates. We have spices. We have a lot of take-home lead. Um, people, it's really uh, in fashion right now to decorate with antiques and kind of a farmhouse look. So we have a, a lot of people who are inadvertently poisoning their grandchildren with their antiques in their homes. We have cosmetics, um, regular American cosmetics, but cultural cosmetics. Uh, drinking water is a source. I think you know that. Firing ranges, people really who are working in those firing ranges. Um, jewelries and toys. And we have a baby food recall right now for lead paint. So I don't know that these are in any particular order. But what I can tell you 
is that housing is right at the top. So there are more children who are getting blood lead elevations in New Hampshire from homes than any other source of lead poisoning that there is. So we have people who are living in owner-occupied homes. We have people living in rental homes, but it's really the housing stock that was built before 1978. So it takes nothing to poison a child. So um, I accidentally poisoned two of my children. I live in an 1830 Cape and uh, we moved in when we were in our mid late late twenties. I don't think we had two nickels to rub together. So we weren't really renovating. We were just living in that house. And um, there was just an invisible layer of lead dust in that house that no amount of house cleaning could have taken care of. So it takes less than a grain of sugar to poison a child. People, a lot of people think children are peeling and chewing paint chips, but that is rarely the case. So children are just the perfect storm, right? So they're at this point uh, under two years old, they have no blood, uh, no brain blood barrier to filter lead from their brain. Um, you don't see what's going on with them until they're older. You, I always say you don't see the purple dots. It's not like chicken pox. Um, their brain is developing. The beautiful thing about lead is it's sweet tasting. It takes trace amounts next to nothing. You'd never really be able to see the lead dust that's poisoning this child. Everything in this child's world is going in their mouth. They're exploring their entire environment orally. There's no immediate symptoms. They don't get sick that night. It's not like a cold. It's not like chicken pox. They're all over the floor. Their hands are in anything. They're, they're pulling, to, um, pulling to stand and they're just getting lead dust all over them. So it's just a perfect, perfect pediatric uh, storm. And it's a really strong neurotoxin. So lead has a neurobehavioral signature and typically our presentations are done by our child development specialist, Gail Gettens, who works in my program. And she goes into the detail on the negative impact on um, children's developing brain, but there's six main things that it impacts. Um, the attention or inattention, their impulsive nature, their executive function, no strategic planning, no impulse control, uh, your visual spatial, that's memory, that's your organizational skills, that's reasoning. Uh, there's behavioral challenges. Um, like I said, there's just no impulse control no emotional regulation. Uh, these children have speech and language delays. Um, they have very limited words early on and they have very fine and gross motor uh, control problems. So I, like I said, I had accidentally poisoned one, uh, two of my children, but one of my children was in special ed um, from four years old all the way through high school. Um, and he's 29 now and it's, it's a permanent thing. You know, when someone breaks their arm, they say, oh, is it better? If they're sick, their cancer, is it better? Um, lead poisoning and how it impacts your brain, that never, ever goes away, ever. Your whole life you're dealing with it. So what do you care? It's not my kid, right? It's not my grandchild, not my nephew. You care because it has an enormous impact on your community. So every one of these children who have, has a blood lead elevation, it is, is, it is a brain injury as if that child went through the windshield of a car. So these children, the majority of them are going into your school system, special education. You know what that cost. These children fall between the cracks because they learn different. They very often don't make it through school they're prone to risky behavior. They end up in your juvenile justice system. And then these, these children grow up to be adults and they end up in the adult criminal system. And then they in turn get married and have children and their children fall between the cracks. It's a cycle. It's so easy to get your kid tested. It is effortless here in New Hampshire. 
So like I said, it's the lot one and two. You take your child to the doctor. It's a single, uh, a simple finger prick. So they, this, this instrument right here sits on the counter and they take three drops of blood. They put it in the instrument. Three minutes later, they have the result. It allows the pediatrician to educate the family if that result comes out high and, and, and do an intervention right then and there. So every kid needs to be tested at one and at two. So let me tell you a little bit about New Hampshire's lead law. So New Hampshire uh, RSA 130A is the lead paint poison control and prevention law. It's the law that my program uh, is responsible for implementing and overseeing. And what it, it does a lot of things, but primarily what it does, it protects young children, 72 months and younger, that's six, that live in rental units. So um, any child with an elevation over five micrograms per deciliter, we provide that family with nurse case management. So we're the liaison between the family, the pediatrician, and ourselves. So we make sure that family gets the, the, the medical care they need. If this child lives in an owner-occupied home like the one I live in, we visit them and we help them understand where are the lead hazards in the home. How can these families, you know, they want to know how they can do their own DIY projects. Can they do them? Do they need to hire a professional? We guide them through that. If these child are, if the children with the elevated blood leads over five are living in a rental units, then we, uh, the property owner, the landlord has no choice. We go in and we do an investigation. If we find that there's lead hazards in that rental unit that that child lives in, um, we, we put that unit under administrative order of lead hazard reduction. Once a unit's under order with the state of New Hampshire, only licensed lead abatement contractors can work on that property. Um, you have units right in your community now that are under administrative order that we've been working with these property owners. So when we go in and do an environmental assessment, whether it's in an owner-occupied property or whether it's in a rental property, we do test for drinking water. So back in 2018, they changed RSA 540A, Section 3A, that's um, tenant law. They changed it so and made it so that every time we went in to do an investigation, uh, the Division of Public Health, my program, was responsible for collecting a water sample. So our goal is to collect a stagnant water sample while we're in the home. It gets sent right here to Hazen Drive to the state lab. If the results are over 5 PPB, 5 PPB of lead in that water, we make a referral to the Department of Environmental Services so they can provide that family education. This picture here is the fact sheet that we designed with DES that we hand out to families and that DES uses for education with those families. If the results are over 15 PBB in the rental unit, the landlord's required by law to install and maintain a water filtration system. Um, I, I cut out the section of 548 down here. I, I seriously know you can't read that but it's in there and, and it says that the, um, if it's over 15, that the landlord's required to install and maintain a water filtration system. There's nothing in the law or any rules that says who's going to police that that happens. So it's, uh, it took a step in the right direction, but it hasn't quite crossed the finish line. Um, and we have, I don't believe since the law started that we've enforced and had a landlord put in a water filtration system yet. So we have um, four bills that are downtown right now. We have Senate bill that are, have led, something to do with lead. So we have Senate bill 371, which is to replenish $3 million into the state's loan fund that's overseen by New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority. This fund is the for the removal of lead hazards. So it's, it's for the removal of lead paint hazards. There's nothing in there about removing service lines, faucets, um, 
again, you know, it was a, the, in 2018 when the law got put in place, it was a really good first step. And it might be worthwhile at some time that someone go back and find funding to do service lines and faucets in housing, but we're just not there yet. So House Bill 1642 um, is requiring blood lead test on file for entry into public school and childcare. So this is an important one. In a lot of other states across the nation, they call this the school gate policy. And it's just, you know, when you go to school, you have to fill out all those health forms. The health forms currently have a spot on them for a blood lead test. But right now the school doesn't require that that test be there. So this is required that a blood lead test be on file for entry into public school and into childcare. So if you're nine months and older and you enter into a new childcare, you'd have to have this on file. Um, the RSA 130 lets parents opt out of the blood lead, blood lead test at their provider office. This is just a simple signing opt out. There's two bills down there for lead in school drinking water and daycare. So House Bill 1421 is about um, lowering the level of lead in school drinking water. DES is taking the lead on that. And I can't speak um, too intelligently on that bill, unfortunately. Senate Bill 452 is very similar. It's lowering the standard of lead in drinking water for schools and for daycares. So, um, so lead is a, it's a housing problem, right? It's not really a health problem. Um, children who have blood lead poisoning don't have huge insurance claims. It's not like asthma. These people aren't frequent flyers at the emergency room. It's not like diabetes where there's, you know, it's a very expensive disease to manage. But what it, the expense is, like the iceberg, it's under the water. It's down the road. We talk about this, right? Special ed, juvenile justice, the adult criminal system. So what could Portsmouth do to make a difference? Um, there's enough data, probably at your level and at my level, that you could know down to the street level where your high-risk neighborhoods are. So we know where the high-risk neighborhoods are for housing. And several years ago, Cindy Clevins and over in DES and my team mapped all the children with blood lead elevations against your service lines. Not service lines, I have the wrong word, the, but not the lines that go to the houses, but the water lines that go into the streets. Um, so, you know, we could dig some of that stuff up. You need to know where the lead is in your community. Um, we have several communities, I believe Portsmouth's one of them that has proactive rental inspections. So every rental unit should be looked at as frequently as you have bandwidth to do that. So some communities do it annually. Communities like Manchester are getting in there every three years. But it's your rental housing that's the most at risk for poisoning these young children. Um, the third one here, you always have the potential of requiring that anybody who asks for a building permit for a 1978 property, that they demonstrate to your uh, building department that they are EPA renovate, repair and paint certified and they know how to use lead safe work practices when they work in these properties. One third of the families that we ask when we do a home visit one third of the families report that they had a renovation in their home in the last six months. So DIY renovation is where the majority of these children are getting their blood lead elevations. Um, I think that New Hampshire needs to do a better job of educating landlords on essential maintenance practices. These rental units are turning over every 12 to 18 months and, they go, and landlords go in there and they might paint or replace some windows or tear up the carpet. If they did some essential work on taking care of lead hazards every time that they turned a unit over, after 10 years, most of that lead would be gone. And obviously, if you could increase testing rates, if you tested all your children. I think I'm winding down here. So this is the next to the last slide. So in between 2015 and 2019, I need to update it with the new data. 
we had 34, over 3,400 children with blood lead elevations. That's 646 children annually with a blood lead elevation of five micrograms per deciliter that has a brain injury that's marching towards special ed and a lifelong journey. Well, I hope that I've been helpful to help you understand a little bit about lead in your community. Um, I will put in the chat box, I will put the link to your, um, your at a glance, your lead exposure data brief. I'm, you can email me questions, you can call me with questions. I'm not sure that your agenda tonight allows for all that for questions, but I'd be more than happy to stick around for a few minutes if that's what you'd like. Really, thank you so much. That was super helpful and informative. Um, so next we have Al Prep from the city of Portsmouth who's gonna present the Portsmouth side of how they're testing lead in copper and water. And then we were hoping after his presentation to open up Q&A for the both of you. So okay. would, it be, would you be okay staying on for Al's presentation? And then the swag can ask both of you uh, questions at the end of his, if that's okay. Certainly. Okay, thank you so much. Your presentation was excellent. So uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Al. Al, I'll even give you the controls here. If you'll be able to advance. And uh, so Al Pratt, uh, we'll segue here. He's going to give us an overview of what the city of Portsmouth's been doing with respect to lead and the water system. I have a lot of ground to cover, two here, but um, that was a good setup because there, there is a very important topic to talk about. I'm glad we're talking about it this type of forum. Um, it's public health concern, especially public health concern for those six and under that are so vulnerable, vulnerable to lead poisoning. I'm focusing on drinking water, and there's we're in the in the thick of it now because there is a new uh, revision to the uh, lead and copper rule that I'll get into. Um, but first, I want to make it clear there is no lead in the sources of our water. The Bellman Reservoir, and the groundwater around here have no lead. In it. We don't have natural deposits of lead in this area, so there's no water in the sources. Um, it all goes to the plumbing in homes and the service lines that connect to those homes. Um, and so I'm going to be focusing on a lot of the, these components here, where the sources of lead are, and a little bit of the history of the lead use restrictions in uh, only components going back to June 1986, where there was an amendment to the Drinking Water, the Safe Drinking Water Act that prohibited the use of pipes, solder, and flux that are not lead free. And back then, this is how they defined lead free. Solder and flux was less than 0.2% lead by weight, and pipes were less than 8% lead. Then you go to 1986, the Safe Drinking Water Amendment at that time strengthened those, those requirements a little bit and they added fix, fixtures and fittings. So like your, your faucets were added at that time that had the brass and bronze components to it that had a lead component to it. Even at this point, it was still that 8% lead was acceptable. Um, so that went into effect in 1997. January 2011, there was a reduction of Lead and Drinking Water Act that redefined what lead free meant. And this was for all of the components, the pipes, fittings, and fixtures, and it dropped it down to a 0.25% was considered lead free. And that didn't go into effect until January of 2014, which it, it surprised me when I look, looked at all, all this and how long it's taken to get to this point of having these real lead free components in plumbing systems. Um, this is just sort of a graphic of the time when, when all this happened. And I wanted to make the point here that you can still go to a hardware store now and buy leaded solder. Um, at one of our sample sites that we had high detection, we did some follow-up investigations and saw under the sink you know, solder just dripping down like an amateur plumber wannabe you know, did the work there. And it became clear that they just used that kind of solder. And that kind of solder is intended for electronics. So you can go buy that kind of electronics. That kind of solder and use it in plumbing and shuffle lead. So a lot of this is, is public education. That's one thing that I hope we can do here. And as, as I'm talking through these slides, any ideas that you can have how we can get the word out. And it goes back to the healthy homes too of educating people with what this are. And that's that's what so much of this is about is we as a water supplier are doing all we can to reduce the corrosivity of the water and supply water for the free, but so much goes to this public education aspect. Um, again, just point so this is 
cut right from the New Hampshire DES healthy homes with lead poisoning prevention programs. A lot of great resources. At the end of my presentation, I have some links to uh, DES and EPA and this program. Uh, the point here is just that it's not from the sources, it's coming from plumbing. And ultimately, the worst time you can get the water is after the water has been sitting in the pipe for a while. The longer that water is in contact with the metal, the more that metal can leach into the water. So when you first turn your tap on in the morning, that's the chance to get the highest lead uh, and metal content in the water. Excuse me, Al, but yep. we're not seeing the slides advance on Zoom. You see sources of lead in water right now? No, we're see still seeing your title slide. Uh, no. I don't know. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> see, they're advancing here. Um, See what happens there. Does it now say sources of lead in water? It does. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. There we go. I'm learning something every day. It's a Zoom education here, too. <laughs> All right. Other resources. This is from the US EPA site, just a graphic of the sources, you know, your typical uh, lead solder in copper pipes inside of homes, your faucets and fixtures can still be that source of, of lead. This also gets into the service lines. Um, lead service lines, galvanized service lines. And in Portsmouth, we predominantly have copper service lines, and that's what we're installing now. But historically, lead service lines have been installed, thankfully, not so much, if at all, in Portsmouth. There are some cities that all they installed were lead service lines. You know, Chicago's in Washington, D.C., and Montreal. A lot of places that that's what they installed the service lines. The service line being the pipe that connects the water main to the house. Um, this graphic, I just wanted to make the point that the city water supply owns the portion of the of the service line from the water main to the curb stop. The curb stop is the valve where we can shut off service to the to the house. That's to what the cap looks like on top. It says water on it. It's not a gas line. This is a water shut off. City owns this side. But this side into the house is owned by the customer. Um, it's important to know that when customers need to change out their service lines or we need to change out service lines, it's all done together. No partial service line replacement is accepted under the new uh, rules. Typically, like I said, this is made out of copper. Um, historically, galvanized was also used, galvanized pipe. There are still some galvanized pipes in the water system here. Issues with galvanized pipe is it's a very rigid pipe, and in order to connect it to the water main, you needed a very flexible pipe, which in many cases a lead jumper or a lead gooseneck was used to make that connection. Um, so that's one why we are looking at galvanized and treating galvanized like lead pipes in the city, doing our best to remove them. Um, in many cases, or in some cases, I should say, when we've done water main replacements, we replaced our side of the service with copper, removed the lead goosenecks. In some cases, the customer hasn't repaired their part of the galvanized lines. Um, I think that's all the point I want to make there. Just uh, what lead looks like. If anyone ever sees this in their house, you need to call immediately. This is a lead service line, typically coming in through the basement floor or the wall, right near their water meter. And there's usually a, a bulb of the lead that's connected to the fittings there. And sort of that dull gray metal, and if you scratch it, it becomes a shiny metal color. And then those photos, those are from Region 5. <laughs> we're, we're in here. They're not, they're not photos. Um, galvanized pipes, like I said, they're steel pipes, they're just zinc coated to theoretically make them last longer, but they still don't last very long within 20 to 40 years. They, they degrade. Um, there's no lead specifically in them, but, but it indicated that there might be a lead jumper associated with that. Um, they do corrode. Many times we get water quality issue calls. And one of the first things I ask is what kind of service line they have, or I can go into our records to see if it might be galvanized line. And oftentimes it's from the corrosion because they corrode from the inside out, They're basically just rusting inside. So I've gotten calls where people say they have like a sand substance in their aerators and their faucets, and it's just iron deposits from the, the degrading pipes. Um, they do fail. 
And they also, as they break down, they can reduce the flow of pressure because of percolation inside the pipe. All that rust. Um, so, some identifying pipe materials. Uh, oh, why are you still here? Uh, copper, typically you can tell copper is by the color, the copper color, like a, like a penny, it's not magnetic. Galvanized is a much harder metal, you scratch it, but it scratches very, very hard to scratch. Um, it is magnetic, so this is when you're checking your service line, you can kind of check this on your own. We have our water meter crew that changes out water meters through the city um, every 10 years. So we're going through that process and we're identifying service lines everywhere we can now. It's been happening for two years now. I think we've been trying to keep up with the records of what the service lines are made of. So they go they can go through this process just to confirm that the service lines are properly galvanized. We're keeping those records. Uh, we haven't found any lead yet, thankfully. Uh, if we do, it's an emergency notification and get out there and talk to the owner to talk to him about it. Um, Lead specifically, if you scratch it, it's very soft, so you can scratch it with a, with a coin or a screwdriver, um, and it turns into a really shiny color. It's very soft, and, and, it's, and it's not not magnetic. Plastic pipes are very obvious to uh, see. They're usually just a color, blue or white pipes. Um, now, quickly over the history of lead and copper rule and what Portsmouth has been doing with uh, the regulations around the <coughs> water supply. Overall, the purpose of the rule is to protect public water system customers from exposure to lead and copper in drinking water. It was originally published in 1991. It's gone through multiple revisions, though the one where we're at right now that was published uh, March 16th of 2021, um, in my opinion, is the, is the most involved revision yet. There's a lot to it. Um, the actual compliance date for that is 2024. I'll go through some of the components of what we're we're doing to be ready to meet our compliance goals in 2024. Um, in 1991, when the lead copper rule came out, the intention was really to see how how much lead and copper was out there in in people's homes. So this is really a sampling program that started where I just had a customer sample their water and it was measured to see, really see how corrosive the water was and as well as see how much lead copper was, was out there and actually leaching into the, into the water. Um, so the action levels and the sort of system-wide basis for the action levels, where of all the samples that you took in, in Portsmouth, there are 60 samples as the full suite of samples that we, we did take back in 1993 when we started this. And if 10% of those exceeded the action le level of 15 parts per billion for lead, that set us into a corrosion control uh, evaluation program. That is what happened. And they went into a corrosion control program, which I'll get into here in a minute, uh, which in involves a number of things to manage the corrosivity of you know, the water. Um, we're sampling public ed education component of this too, and a lead service line replacement program as part of that. Uh, so Portsmouth corrosion control in 1995, Portsmouth uh, had a corrosion control study done and set up our corrosion control program. It's quite simple, really. Uh, it's focused around pH management. Um, our battery supplies, we add sodium hydroxide for pH adjustment, just to make sure we're in the less corrosive range of 7.2 to 7.8 is our target pH. Uh, thankfully, the groundwater in the city area has a pH naturally of 7.2, 7.5. We don't need to do anything with that. And we add orthophosphate at all of our sources. Um, this is a chemical that creates a coating on the inside of the pipes. It appears to be inside of, of metal pipes and uh, creates some of the barriers so the water is in direct contact with the metal. So this reduces the potential for corrosion. Um, it's added at all of our sources and we target a, a one milligram per liter dosage of that, which is relatively low compared to some cities around the world. Um, our lead and copper sample program, like I said, is very dependent on customers. Our normal program, we have 30 uh, homes in the program now. Actually, we have 60, and they kind of vary year to year. Um, but we take, we require the, the customers to be a part of this. They need to first thing in the morning get up and turn on a hot and cold water in their faucet. Well, first leader, that's sort of the worst case. That stagnant water that's been sitting there for six hours. 
Um, so we are dependent on them to help with the program. Uh, the sites, we're looking for priority sites and where we know lead, and really we don't know of any lead out there. So kind of go to where the, where the highest likelihood of lead to be uh, has to be our older homes that we're looking at pre 1950s. Um, and yeah, plenty of those. Uh, they all the sites need to be pre approved by the state, which has not been an issue. Um, part of what we have been trying to do is, is continuously add more sites. Um, because testing the same site year after year doesn't really get you anywhere. If you know it's good, we're trying to find the lead now. So we're trying to add more sites each year and expand that uh, list. Um, like I said, in Portsmouth, we have 30 active sites now. If we ever went above the action level again, that triggers a full 60 sites uh, twice a year sampling program. We are now sampling on an annual cycle. Here's some of the, the results from history here in 2003 we instituted the corrosion control program and over time the levels have, have dropped off uh, quite steadily um, keep in mind these are the lead parts per billion of the 90th percentile so centile so if you took our 30 samples and, and ordered them from least to most it's like the third or fourth sample in there is our is our that's the sample that goes here so it could be there are some that Occasionally are higher than that, like the one I said that had the electronics uh, solder at a higher level. We did the research to see what the problem was. And that was sort of an outlier. Some other results from peas, similar and sort of an outlier in 2003 there, but um, really consistent otherwise. Newcastle, for some reason, had some very high, they have some very full houses out there. So I suspect there were some specific case issues um, associated with those. Um, as our corrosion control program was in place, levels have dropped off. Uh, now getting to the revised lead and copper rule 2021. Big component of this is the inventory of the service lines. We have, we have a lot of paper records, tie cards and things when service lines were installed. We know <coughs> over half of what the service lines are made of right now. By 2024, we our goal is to know what all of the service lines are, are made of. Um, if 24, 24 comes, which is that's the compliance date for the revised lead copper roll, we need to send out notice to all the customers to say, we don't know what your service line is. It may be lead, beware. We don't want to have to get to that point of um, worrying people when necessary, but we're going to do all we can to, to do what we can to um, fill our inventory. Another component of this inventory that's required by the rule is it needs to be accessible to the public. So we plan to have an online map, kind of like an accessory map where you can just click on your property and see what your service line is made up. It's sort of that public outreach. Um, notification that goes along with that. Make sure anybody that has a lead service line or a galvanized service line knows that, knows the risks, and encouraging them to remove them or get up to the plan to remove them. Uh, sampling. Same, same as far as the prioritizing lead and galvanized lines. The revised rule has a find and fix requirement for any sites that are over 15 parts per billion. We've been doing that anyway, at least as long as I've been here. Anything over five parts per billion, we're, we're researching, we're, we're asking if, if they'd be interested in resampling, doing an, another first flush sample as well as doing some flushed samples to see if just flushing the water um, helps reduce the concentration. Um, there's a new trigger level in the in the rule. Anything over 10 parts per billion will trigger additional sampling um, and follow-up activities. And ultimately, replacement of all the lead galvanized service lines. Um, that's the real goal of this revised plan: to get all lead out, get all the galvanized lines out of the lines. And this requires both the city's responsibility to get our side out, but it's going to also require customers to get their side out. Um, and there's uh, some loan requirements that will go along with that, so we can uh, get customers to do the changeouts and be able to pay for them over time. Whenever a uh, service line is replaced, we need to provide water supply or needs to provide pitcher filters. Um, the filters that can remove lead because of any residuals that might be left in the, in the lines where they're flushing through their system. And that's pitcher filters for at least for six months is required. Schools and daycares, their revised rule um, has a requirement of 20% of elementary schools and 20% of daycares get sampled every year, the first five years of the program, 
we're going to really start until 2024, 2029. Uh, there is a waiver for states that have a program in place. And that's what I believe the Senate Bill 452 is doing, to basically establishing it. So the state, the state has already started, started this back in 2016. They had voluntary, um, voluntary requests for sampling from schools and daycares. SB 247 um, was, was approved in, in February 2018. That required sampling in all schools and daycares, and the DES handle all of that um, data. And, and it's all available online as well. All so, results from that. So, so I, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Uh, those uh, from the committee remember, um, and if, if you're new, um, and also listening out there, we did have uh, Ken Lynchy from uh, the, uh, the city of Portsmouth uh, school system came and gave a, a, a really good summary of, of all the actions that the city of Portsmouth and uh, the school department have done uh, for the, the city schools. So that information was presented to the committee, I think, about six months ago, and it, it is on our uh, website uh, presentation information. And and. This SB uh, 452 aligns quite well with the requirements in the revised uh, comparable, except for the dates. This is this is making this the sampling required before 2024, which is great. We'll get ahead of it all you know, to wait till 2024 to start sampling. Um, just some takeaways that I wanted to put up here. Know what your service line is made of. Um, it's easy to go find your water meter and see what the line is. This is something that. It'd be great if people could do this. It'd be great if we could have it online. No. Take a picture of your, your service line here and tell us what it is. Keep records of it. Things to know about um, uh, how old is your plumbing? Is it pre-1986? How old are your fishes, your, your faucets? If it's pre-1997, it might have high concentrations of lead. If it's between 1997 and 2014, it might have up to that 8% of lead um, associated with it. Know where your water meter is and your shutoff valves are. That's just common sense if any plumbing ever happens. House, you want to be able to shut your system down. And then you have water treatment and know what it's designed for, know what it's certified to remove. Uh, note that the, the NSF um, NCE certification standard 53 is for lead reduction. And then maintain your treatment system. You really need to know how often filters need to be changed out and what needs to be done to maintain your treatment system. Treatment systems can cause worse problems um, if they're not. And know your lead risk. Test your water for lead. It's a simple thing to do. There are a lot of labs, and then we actually have a list of local labs, or labs in New England, on the website. If you go to the city website, under water um, resource information and resources, we have a PDF there with a list of labs and their contact information. Um, a lead test for water is anywhere between twelve and thirty dollars, depending on where you go. So it's not not big money, but it helps you a lot. I uh, recommend taking that first flush, that worst case scenario from the faucet that you drink from, as well as take a, take a sample from when you normally fill up your glass. People don't usually fill up their glass of water with the first flush anyway. You run until it gets cold. Run until it gets cold until you normally fill the glass and fill your sample bottle. That will give you a good idea of what you're actually doing with those two. Um, another thing to think about there, too, is um, if you're using a refrigerator, bottle door type thing, you might want to sample that. Um, and from all the taps they use for drinking water, I know my kids get a big glass of water when they're going to bed and brush their teeth, but they get their drinking water. That's a different faucet, it's an older faucet, had it tested, but you know, keep in mind wherever you're getting the water. Uh, what, if you, what do you do if you detect that? Resample, check your other taps, that'll help you diagnose whether it's a specific faucet or it's from your old plumbing system. Um, see if you can manage it with flushing. So if you run the line until it gets cold, does it do the lead detection drop off? Um, find the source and replace it if you can. If it's as, as simple as changing a, a faucet, then that's a great solution. And if you have to, you can't find where it is and you're still getting infections of lead, um, look into getting a treatment system certified to do that. Contact information. I think these links will still be live when we turn this into a PDF so people can go and get more information from the EPA and Health and Human Services and all the PDFs. Um, and then you can always contact me and uh, Mason Caceres is our water quality specialist. He's the guy that really coordinates the whole lead proper sampling program. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Al. Thank you. Good idea.
Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> um, to it. You did my first one where you get a test. Um, so, thank you for that. You, uh, you talk about um, copper slash lead pipes. Uh, is that, can you identify them by visually identify them? Yeah, or, copper pipes. There's a, there's a table that I have in there for copper pipes. Copper pipes are fine. That's what we're using. Right. Where it's very good. It's, in, it's a copper color. Um, the lead and copper rule. I might be confusing too. The lead and copper rule came out as a fluid with copper with lead because there was concern that copper was leaching off and copper could be a problem with the lead. The, the, the copper actual limit is 1.3 milligrams per liter, which is quite high compared to the lead. And the, the le level that causes any kind of health effects is much higher than that. So it's not, it, it's become a non issue in a lot of cases now. So, so I know. Um, I live in an 1894 house, you know. So, okay. um, so and, but I know I've replaced a lot of the plumbing in it because there's no lead pipe, but there was an old copper pipe too. Is, is old copper pipe partially lead? Is that only the, the solder that holds it together? Okay. That's the yeah, no, I've, I've replaced any that I had. Well, there's probably solder joints in the walls that I. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, and the old um, pre 1986 solder yeah. has 50% of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the charcoal filters that you say that is, what's the number of uh, standard 53, I think it was. So your normal mm -hmm. activated carbons or general carbons may or may not be able to remove that. It has to be certified. And it's okay. like a cigarette on there that was NSF approved for that removal. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, I have a question for uh, Beverly, if you're still with us. I am. Sure. Uh, I was wondering if you might uh, have some of the, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, opine on why the, uh, the, the testing rates were so low for Portsmouth. Um, they're pretty, uh, they fit right in with the rest of the state. So it's not like you're an oddity. So testing rates across the state right now, it's uh, testing rates for one-year-old are always a little higher. They're always hovering in the 60% and two-year-olds always in the 50%. Um, and I don't really have the, I don't have the answer why. So met children who are insured by Medicaid, they're under federal regulation that all those children should be insured. All those children should be tested, 100% of them. Plus we have a lead law but we still have a lot of families that don't have a medical home. Or if you were to talk with Walter Horman at Lilac Peds or any one of your local providers and you gave him a list of children in his practice, he would tell you, I've never seen this child in my life. So families just don't get their children in. I think, I think we're doing a good job of educating our providers. I think that there's just a lot of families who are not getting their children in, or those children are having a lot of other immunizations. Why do I want to, you know, give my child one more finger prick or one more venous lead lead sample? Yeah. So, so Beverly, let me uh, moderate here a second. Uh, Kim McNamara, our health officer, uh, did text me. She's got some input here. So. Go ahead, Kim. Uh, thank you. Am I clear? Yep. Yes. Great. Uh, Beverly and Al, thank you. Very, very uh, great information. The first thing I wanted to mention actually to this whole group um, is that Claremont was mentioned as a, as a place, Beverly, where there's quite a bit of lead work that goes on. And I was really fascinated that their building trade students in their high school take the EPA safe lead removal certification as part of their high school education. And when they graduate, they actually graduate with that certification. Yes. I've spoken to a couple people here in Portsmouth about emulating that program here. The, the thing is though, that the superintendent is le leaving soon or at the end of this year, and it's been two years of COVID. So I don't know if this group can make recommendations that are beyond water issues, but if the group would consider 
making as one of our final recommendations that high school students be supported in getting this EPA led safe lead renovation certification as part of their uh, graduation as Claremont did. We need people in the building trades desperately. And all the calls that we go out to for lead paint removal, you know, 90% of them, it's not being done correctly. So that's uh, information for the group. Um, so I have the same question about the percentages being low um, and was going to ask you if you knew. I would guess that some of that um, reason that we're not where we should be is because of language barriers that we have for the families that are most affected um, and also transportation issues. So perhaps um, the, our local health department can do some public education around the need to get um, blood tests done in their native languages. So it's and when we were calling people for COVID vaccines and all, people were just so grateful to have a, a voice on the end of a phone that, that could either speak to them in their language or get information. So that might be one way we can boost those tests. Um, I have a few more comments. Is it okay to continue? Yes, um, I, I noticed uh, Hope does have uh, her hand raised too. So we'll go to her after, after you're done, Kim. Okay, I'll be quick. Um, I just don't, Beverly, do you have any information about uh, residents growing their vegetables and soil that's been abused for 400 years and if there's lead uptake in what they might be eating because of that? You're, you're spot on. There is lead intake on these, in, in, years ago in Manchester, these gardens that were right in between these tenements and these immigrant families were growing all their groceries in this little 20 by 20 foot plot. Um, and we were looking for financial relief to bring in clean soil, take the dirty soil up, bring in clean soil. Um, I don't know that we've had a particular blood elevated case where we've investigated and identified it's the soil. I mean, it's hard to say it's the soil when the family's living in a 150 year old house that's held together with lead, right? So it could um, be, I mean, the soil is just a contributing factor. These children have a lot of contributing factors. So it's the yeah. house, there's a little lead, you know, there could be a little lead in the water from the faucets. I mean, it's not one thing. It all contributes to your body burden. Well, so and there's a push garden in soil is part of it. Okay. There's a push in Portsmouth and, and the health department's kind of supportive of this if it's, if it's done correctly for more locally grown foods and more people having support, sort of food security for that. And there's yeah. more community gardens being discussed. So I think the water testing and the soil testing might be an important part of that. Again, I don't know if this group would make that recommendation. Um, I wanted to ask you quickly about local workforce issues and let you know that you know our health department is severely understaffed um, and it's very difficult to add staff, but we are trying again this year. Um, but we do the daycare inspections, the school inspections, we go out to in sanitarian living conditions and poor housing conditions. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if there's a way that we can help. Um, and I wasn't sure if what Al was saying is that that, that is included in what the city already does, because of course we wouldn't want to duplicate efforts. But if that if that sort of investigation is not done, and we're inspecting these places, it might be that we can be the boots on the ground to grab the water samples and get them to the Concord lab, maybe more quickly than Concord can respond down here. Um, and um, I think you answered that. Uh, I did want this whole group to know that Portsmouth does not have routine housing inspections, either at, um, change of occupancy, um, you know, either when someone moves or even at three-year intervals like Manchester does. We have never had a routine inspection mm -hmm. program for housing conditions here, except for in our um, boarding houses. So just to be clear about that. Um, mm -hmm. And my last question, thank you everybody for your patience. Um, why haven't, hasn't the state forced in, uh, filtration systems? Is it because you haven't had kids that meet that criteria or is it an issue of authority? It's an issue of authority. So RSA 138 defines what a lead hazard is and, it, and in the RSA it does not define anything to do with water as a lead hazard. No jewelry, no water, you know, nothing like that. It's just, it's really just all building components. And 
the testing of the drinking water is in housing lots and RSA 540A, 540, which is tenant law, right? So, and who's going to well, police who? So, so a landlord puts in a filtration system and then there needs to be a mechanism to police them every six months so they change the filters, right? Where would that come from? So it's it was a step in the right direction, but I mean we can do better. Well, this is what I'd like to suggest from my perspective, and I'm sure there's other opinions. But if this is regarding children with elevated blood levels, um, so we know there's harm being done, and and we know it's environmentally and it's related to the water, um, the health officer can address all public health nuisances and. Although we wouldn't want to be policing 300 rentals every six months because we don't have the workforce, yeah, we I don't think that many kids that would be in that situation. So if there were 30, um, we could just put it on the calendar for every six months. Um, you know, go check the filter or have some sort of system. So, so if that would be very helpful to our local kids, I think that you and I could talk about that offline. Yeah, and it circles back to that confidentiality agreement. Right, the, the ability to share PHI. But you would be fantastic yes. boots on the ground. I mean, it's your community. Right. Uh, thank, thank you, Kim. Um, we hope, hope uh, has been waiting here with her hand up, so we'll shift to her. But uh, uh, Kim, I did on follow up, Al Pratt will get with you uh, to talk about um, duplicate efforts. So, uh, um, He'll, he'll circle back with you after this, this meeting. Um, oh. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just first in circling back, I would say I, it, I put my email in the chat, anyone that would like to reach out to me about the EPA certification requirements. Um, I don't think it's something that needs to wait and go through this committee for a recommendation. I can certainly connect people to the right contacts at um, in the school district for our CTE programs and other other programming connections that uh, might have an interest in picking up the EPA certification. So if, if anyone would like to contact me, feel free to just forward the information and I will connect you with the appropriate parties. Um, I did want to back up a little bit because I too had questions around the shortfall of the, the hitting the 100% mark for testing. Um, I, I think I understood that if you're on Medicaid, then it's federally mandated that you get the testing. But I was just wondering if you're not on Medicaid, is there a cost association? And I'm just wondering if there's barriers of transportation or cost or other barriers that may be getting in the way of uh, people getting their kids tested. So I would like to know maybe how we can find out more about that versus just making the assumption that parents don't want to get their kids tested. Because um, if there are barriers, I I'd like to look into those from the school side of what we could do from a resource perspective to help remove some of those barriers. Um, and then thirdly, I, I just, was thinking as far as public education, these were great presentations. And I think there's some pretty down and dirty, simple slides that could be extracted out and put in a kind of a flyer or a slick or a document that could go out to families even at the beginning of the year when, when we're already educated and the nurses are already putting information out to the public school families around vaccinations and things to be looking out for, especially considering the fact that lead poisoning does mask a lot of behavioral issues. And so you, you just wouldn't know that um, unless you had your child tested. So I would be eager to work with whomever to gather some of that information and maybe put it on the school side and get that information out through, through our nurses just to educate our population a little bit more on the resources that we have to, to get testing. Uh, I know $30 is a minimum price for testing to some, but it's really not to about 20% of our, our population within our school district. And so again, I would look to see what may be the barriers for some people to 
to have that testing done in their homes and um, how we may be able to come alongside of them. So those were just some initial thoughts I had in listening to, to everyone's um, comments. So I appreciate the presentations. Do you have any other questions? Or any questions? Thank you. Um, and I want to thank Hope for uh, bringing both those up. It uh, seems like education on this subject is very important, given our old housing stock, uh, you know, given where we are all this report. Um, and I also think that giving that EPA self led, safe led certification at the high school would be an awesome thing. I know some of the kids, they have a uh, welding program, they have several trade programs that would be a wonderful way to educate the kids, um, educate them while they're young. Um, as far as routine inspections on rentals, uh, whether it be the change of occupancy or every three years, this might be a question for Kim, would that be a policy change made by the council? Uh, would that, how would that be implemented? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the second half of your sentence. Your uh, I just you mentioned that we do not have routine inspections on rentals in Portsmouth, uh, whether it be in right. or if we were to implement such a um, inspection, how would we go about that? Would that be a policy change by the council? Well, the building department has just put on additional inspectors, but but I think that's to keep up with the current uh, demand. I don't know that those inspectors were. Um, d designated to do that sort of uh, routine inspection. Um, so I think it would probably, there need, there would need to be an increase in workforce. If the building department were to do it, they would probably ask for an additional inspector. Um, if we were to do it, we would definitely need a couple. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Um, this question is for Beverly. Uh, in talking about people's, maybe the um, declining of the lead testing at a doctor's office when their kids are already getting multiple vaccines. I can completely relate to that. Do you know, are there home testing kits? Because this is just a finger prick. So is there home testing kits that could be sent home with families if they wanted to do it at a different time or they want to do it in the office? Uh, no, there are not home testing kits for doing blood lead analysis. So uh a physician has a choice of doing a capillary finger stick, which is super easy and non-invasive. Um, and most providers have a pretty good success rate with that. Or they give the mom a lab slip to take the child down to the phlebotomist to do a venous, a vena puncture, which no child wants that. Um, we have a pretty high failure rate of getting families to go do that. There is strong evidence across the nation that if the states that put in the school gate policy that a blood lead, blood lead test is required to get into public school, that that does increase testing rates. The city of Claremont has a, a school gate policy. They implement it at the school board level so that every child entry, every child that enters into public school has to have a blood lead test on file. So moms and dads know about their younger siblings that they have to have it done and they're kind of getting it ahead of time. Great, thank you. And then one other question, you know, we talk about the five TPB or, um, you know, but it, it sounds like you're saying a very trace amount of lead can poison a child. So why is the standard five? It's, to me, it seems like it should be zero. So can you talk a little bit about like why that five was established and why that is the standard, but yet trace amounts can cause a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, I can talk to that. I'm sorry, there's, I have a Teams um, icon open. It keeps making this beeping noise and I don't know how to shut it off. So I'm sorry about that. So the um, Center for Disease Control has what they call a blood lead reference value. And they just lowered the blood lead reference value down to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. So CDC says any child with a blood lead over 3.5 has more lead in their blood than 90% of the children in the population. So New Hampshire, our action level is five micrograms per deciliter. So I started working here in the program in 08 in 2008, the action level in the state of New Hampshire was 20 micrograms per deciliter. We lowered it down to 10, then we lowered it down to 7.5, and now we've lowered it down to five. 
to lower any further, it's like Kim keeps coming back to workforce. We, you know, require workforce at Health and Human Services. But what really happens is there's a lot of pushback from the landlords because they own these are homeowners. They own these homes that they didn't put the lead in, but now they're responsible for dealing with the lead. And so, and there's, you know, there's financial implications of having your property put under administrative order and having the lead removed. So in, in New Hampshire, you can have lead removed. Um, there's re EPA renovate, repair and paint, which is for renovating, repair and painting your home. But if you know you have lead, if your property is under administrative order, then you have to hire a licensed lead abatement contractor. And a house like mine, a little 1830 Cape, I mean, I could put 120,000 into just removing the lead. My house is only worth, you know, 280,000. So I can't put 120 into it. So it's just, it's the financial implications. That's kind of a long, I was a long-winded answer. Did that help you? Yeah, that is helpful. Thank you. Okay. And then I think just the last question I have for you is, you know, when a child does have an elevated blood level and yeah. they're assigned to one of the nurse case managers that you were talking about, does this program have enough resources for these children to get early intervention as soon as possible? So we make referrals to these children to early intervention, but it's up to the parents to make it happen. So we can make a referral. We can explain to the family about long-term implications of lead poisoning. Some families uh, sign right up for early intervention and get their kids right into Head Start or early Head Start or whatever they need. But we have families who don't see what's coming down the road. They just see this perfectly beautiful child with no evidence that anything is wrong. And we're talking to them about what's gonna happen in third grade. And they're, they're just worrying about tomorrow. So we make referrals to early intervention, but not all those children get connected. Perfect. Thank you very much. And then Al, I just have a couple of questions for you. Um, you talked about the galvanized goose necks, and those could be a potential source of lead. Yeah, galvan galvanized goosenecks lead. Galvanized goosenecks are a lead pipe. Okay, and you're you're the city's working to identify how many there are, or do you have an idea of how many we have? We have an we have partial idea because it's connected with galvanized lines, so we're still inventorying to see how many galvanized lines there are out there. Okay. Based on the numbers we have, it's less than a 05 percent are galvanized lines. Um, and there is still a record of galvanized lines that are still out there where we have already removed those lead snakes. We don't know of any lead snakes out there. Um, if a resident finds out that they have lead in their water, what from you know faucet or soldering or whatnot, are there resources for them if they can't afford to change those out? Is there any programs within the state or the city where people could apply for funds to change those out should they want to reduce their lead? Faucets, faucets, I don't know of any. No, no, not at the moment. If, if it gets into the service line replacements, part of the revised rule requires you to do something. Okay. And then lastly, you talked about um, you have about five homes that participate in your sampling right now, but you'd like to have more or you're looking for more. Do you have an idea of how many? What would be the ideal number of homes participating in this program? And because certainly I think one of the things that SWAG can do is try to help raise awareness in the community that you are looking for people to participate. So about what would be ideal? Right. Well, we have we have over 60 and it varies year to year. We go 30 one year, the 30 next year, and we have more than 60 private closing seven Um so we have that, but we do want to keep giving more homes and more for older homes. Homes that are likely to have some lead, lead solder. Um, so yeah, that, that would be great. And we can get the word out. We do a lot of research just on um, assessment mapping and pulling up uh, databases of ages of homes, uh, randomly that way. Um, but probably be good for that. Any other questions, Brian? I I had one more question. I'm sorry. It's hope. Or did you mean for the room, um, Andrea? Oh, no, go ahead, Hope. Okay. 
Uh, it, it was for Beverly. I'm sorry. You had mentioned that Claremont had a school policy at the school gate policy. Do you know if that is on their website or do you have a copy of that policy? I would love to have it as um, an example to present forth to our policy committee. So Hope, I wrote down your email address okay, on this great. Piece of paper right here and I have it on my desktop and I'll email it to you tomorrow. Okay, fantastic. And also yeah. if, you, if you do have any type of um, just kind of a one sheet document that you could recommend that might be helpful for nurses to put it around the lead poisoning issues um, and then some contact information. If we can certainly create something like that, but if there's something already out there. Are um, you talking about your school nurses or your- For school nurses, as well as just for the school to have and educating um, our, our constituents a bit yep. more around the you know the issues and I, I think a lot of what we've covered tonight people think actually I don't think people actually think about lead poisoning um, but I, I certainly don't think they think about it in the context of the numbers you put forward tonight. So the Health and Human Services has beautiful fact sheets um, drinking okay. water and lead hazards and lead in children they're available in five languages and I put the drinking water one in the chat but if any of those fact sheets are of interest to you, you we would let you rebrand them with your city logo and, okay. and take ownership of them and you could distribute them. Um, and they're available in multiple languages. They've got a nice sixth grade reading level. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah. May I make one more comment? This is Kim. Yes, go ahead, Kim. Thank you. Um, Beverly, you said that um, we can get the data, street level data for Fort Smith regarding our more um, maybe risky housing. And if there were an effort to put in housing inspections and we needed to start in some place, it would seem that we could take that street level data. We can certainly GIS that we do that with a lot of public health um, projects that we work on and have a map that, that we could reference that if we had some sort of a housing inspection program to begin, we could just begin with those high risk areas. Um, that might be a start. And just to complete the question that I uh, answered earlier, um, that we do have an ordinance that requires routine housing inspections, but because it is for every time a uh, apartment is, um, someone moves out of it, there's supposed to be inspection. I think our housing code officer felt pretty overwhelmed and that he couldn't possibly do that. But we do have that in ordinance and we can look at that and the uh, housing officer, we do have that position. It's just not something that has been done prior, but could start, I assume. Thank you. Thank you again to thank Beverly you. and to Al. Oh, I'm sorry, was there a follow-up? Okay. Uh, thank you again to Beverly and to Al for your, your excellent presentations tonight and to the SWAG for all the wonderful follow-up questions. Beverly, thank you very much for your extended time as well to stay on and answer our questions. Oh, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure. I, Al, I learned some stuff. It was very interesting. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. So, uh, <laughs> Next, it's, we'll turn it back to you, Brian. Okay, hey, I, I will. We looks like we have 26 minutes, so I will uh, try and. Are we? I'll, I'll ask Stephanie if she sees a full slide of um, year in review. Yes, you're good. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. So I'll I'll be, be quick. I I sent to everyone um, here the uh, the uh, a word. PDF document and it's now on the website too. Um, but I'll, I'll do some of the, the snapshot highlights. Um, we've been talking a lot about water quality, but quantity is a, a big thing that uh, we've been dealing with the last few years um, with a, a couple of droughts. And, and we entered last year in um, on the heels of very dry end of 2020. And then 2021 didn't start out a whole lot better. Uh, we were pretty dry and then got extremely dry in June and we were getting ready to put uh, some uh, restrictions on. We had uh, partial restrictions, but then uh, come July, we really got inundated with a couple big storms and uh, no more drought. So uh, as you can see, 
Um, we had uh, a couple of big uh, months, July, August, and September were, were kind of average with about four inches. And then October, again, uh, we also uh, got quite a bit of precipitation. Um, somehow I, I clipped a slide there, the uh, December's not on there. And we were actually uh, below normal for November, December, and January, but we're kind of holding steady. Our sources are doing pretty, pretty good. Um, from the Boston Globe, thanks. Uh, shout out to Stephanie. Um, who uh, sent me this information from the Boston Globe. They do an annual summary of what the weather was like down there. And, uh, you know, not exactly what we encountered, but pretty darn close. Um, they have a, a eight, they go back to 1872. Um, the average temperature, like we've seen all over the country and the world to some degree, uh, was above normal. Uh, June was the warmest on record, so you saw a little slide that it was not only dry, it was also warm, so hot and dry. Water demands were really up in August and September, and uh, October were also very warm. And so what Al does is he tracks, this is our reservoir, and so you can see we, we had a pretty big drought in 2016, and, and we were looking at the same trend at our reservoir in 2020. And uh, what you can see though, is when we do get rains, we get a quick recovery. So people ask, you know, how do you know how much water you have and how do you know where it's going? Well, we, a drought is an emergency that comes to you slowly. <laughs> so, so one good thing about a drought is, you know, it's a, you know, we might get a nor'easter this weekend. We might get a storm, you know, those, those come at you, you know, a thunderstorm, whatever, but a drought is slow coming and you do have time to prepare, which we did. We responded, fortunately, we uh, recovered um, fairly quick. And as you can see uh, with the blue line, uh, we're, we're doing uh, well right now. Our water sources, um, this is something that Al tracks uh, predominantly for the Portsmouth system. Um, we, our surface water is the biggest portion of water and uh, that held pretty steady last year. Um, the pea supply gets uh, water from three wells now. The uh, Haven well came into service in August of last year. So it now um, will pretty much, um, when we show this next year, you're gonna see a pie chart that is gonna be a third uh, for the most part, uh, probably uh, all the sources uh, the three wells will be about 30% each, and then there will be some supplemental course with water because when we have real high demands, we do that. Um, but overall, um, tracking, I, we get this question a lot. Well, gee, all the growth, all the um, new development in the city. Um, this is annual. This is combined for course with NPs. Our average water last year, as you can see, 3.59 million gallons a day. That's the average uh, pumpage of water. And as you can see, we were going through the 80s and 90s where it was this steady trend up and then it leveled off. And in recent years, we actually are seeing a reduction because we're, we're seeing efficiencies through our customers. We have raised rates and people pay when they say they have a water bill. It's their combined water sewer bill. <laughs> sewer rates are, are, are uh, a pretty big incentive for people to be efficient with their water use because. Um, uh, the rates are, are fairly high, um, but all told, this, this has helped us. The other thing too, is we've been very aggressive with finding leaks in the system. So some of those years, the mid years um, here, especially this area, I'll tell you, uh, we know from history that there were a lot of leaks in the system and essentially pump of water into pipes that just goes out. Um, that's not the case and big credit to all the staff in our field that have really worked hard and we've, we've heard, we have a leak detection firm that comes in and, and can find leaks that we don't even know are there. Um, so that's, that's been really good. And, you know, the, the thing we can also look at is our customer usage. So we are seeing that big decline in what we're supplying and this is this differential and um, actual customer usage is actually fairly steady. Um, and uh, you can see the numbers uh, through the units we delivered. Um, another aspect of how the system is tightening up is the fact that we've done a lot of water main replacements. I know related to lead is the fact that 
we've pulled out a lot of old pipe. So this is the, the Lincoln area. You can see the center part of probably the older part of downtown, all these neighborhoods here um, that are in the darker blue, they've all got new pipes. So through that, there have been you know, services replaced and plumbing and renovations and all that. So um, that bodes fairly well. It also has helped us with the inventory. So when we go in areas where pipes have been replaced, we can, uh, you know, we, we have a better idea of what's there. Um, other things we've done, um, you know, through the years, and Al's been instrumental in our supply. We, we have not been able to actually find new water, but what we're doing is optimizing the water we have. So one project we have going on right now is to renovate the Collins well. You can see in the background is the existing Collins well. Um, we drilled a second well because the wells over time, you, you, you can think of it, it's just a, a straw that goes in the ground. It has a screen and the screens get plugged up over time. So essentially you get the water there, you just can't get it. It's like, one of those, uh, when, you, when you have a, a straw that just starts getting difficult to, to, to get any more uh, liquid through the straw. So uh, there's only so much you can do to recover that amount of, of water that you're able to get out of there. So uh, one thing we've done is, is we've uh, installed a second well. It says Collins Well B, but now it's been renamed Collins Well 2. So we have Well 1 and Well 2, and that project's going on. Another project that uh, has come up and is in our CIP is to replace um, the water that comes from Madbury under the bay uh, to put a third line in that would be new um, just for additional redundancy and uh, uh, go under the bay because as you saw that one graphic, the 60% of water from Madbury, when you add the wells, about 70% of the water that goes into the Portsmouth system comes under the bay and up into Newington. So we're working on that. We are having um, quite a bit of uh, issues with trying to get um, access and permits from property owners on the, uh, the Durham side. So we're working diligently on that and hopefully that'll happen yet um, this year. And if not um, next year. Um, and then lastly, we're working, we just obtained a grant to work on an interconnection through the, the, the final bridge that's going over from uh, Dover to Newington, the bicycle pedestrian bridge, and that would be an interconnection between the Dover and Portsmouth systems that doesn't exist, but what it would do is it would link the communities all the way up to Rochester and all the way down to Seabrook. Um, essentially, every, all these other water systems were to some degree interconnected, and this would interconnect the entire seacoast, which is good in case of emergencies, and redundancy in that. And lastly, uh, the other well upgrades are um, the Madbury Well 5 and Alice uh, working on uh, getting that all constructed. Our contractor's out there and by this summer, um, Well 5 should be up and online. Um, other overall water quality, um, both systems, if you go to our website and also delivered to our customers are these annual water quality reports which Alan Mason and, and other staff work on, Stephanie, and uh, we're pretty, pretty proud that Andrea had, was instrumental in helping us to really beef up these uh, reports a few years back when PFAS really entered the uh, equation. So um, those are online, but uh, we'll be working on our 2021 reports that will be going out here um, in May and June. Um, so PFAS, uh, this is a, a shot of the interior of the PEAS water treatment system that went online last year. The blue filters up front have resin medium that filter out the PFAS. And in the back, there are some silver uh, vessels that are the granulated activated carbon. And uh, since that system has been online, you can see the PFAS, which is um, non-detect. So basically we've been sampling, uh, initially it was, uh, you know, we've, we've been sampling um, weekly for a while and then um, we're now monthly sampling and you can see the amount of gallon that, gallons that have been treated through the PEAS uh, treatment system and we're uh, non-detect through um, to date actually right now of the regulated compounds. 
Um, the PFAS in the uh, enforcement system, uh, we do, we are in compliance again there with the state standard, which is four quarter monitoring and then averaging those. Um, and these are the results there in summary. Um, and uh, at our last meeting, um, Andrea covered the, the PFPRA, which is a two um, chain compound, which is one a PFAS that uh, was uh, identified in some sampling that was done through a uh, NRDC study. And um, that uh, sample was detected from PFPRA at 35 parts per trillion. So um, working with um, the state, Andrea contacted the state and also Merrimack Water was involved with this. Um, there are going to be some follow-up samples done now with the state. And uh, those actually are going to take place March 1st. Um, now we have a date set. And uh, there are going to be some duplicate samples. And the EPA lab is going to analyze these because it's a, a newly um, quantified compound and not really analyzed by too many labs. So the EPA is going to uh, sample for PFPRA. And a duplicate sample will be taken using the original lab that did the sampling um, last year. And um, for the Portsmouth system, there will be a TAP sample at, at DPW, which will mimic uh, to some degree the uh, previous sample that was taken in the system last year because that location um, is not available, but DPW is very close to um, where that is. And then we're also going to, because uh, the state said they could do 10 samples, but they're splitting them up between us and Merrimack and a couple other places in the state. So we're going to have three samples ourselves. So they'll uh, sample at Madbury. Um, Al will be with them um, sampling there. Also, we'll be doing our, our quarterly sampling at the same time ourselves. So we're going to do Madbury, we're going to do the Portsmouth well, and then we will do that TAP sample. Have any questions for Brian? Yeah, sure. Thank you. And next slide, please. So we just we have two more agenda items to move through quickly before we wrap up or go into public comment and then wrap up. Um, so uh, last year, one of the suggestions from the SWAG and one of the recommendations we made to the council was for this the Safe Water Advisory Group to host a community drinking water forum for the broader community here in Portsmouth, um, just to provide education and provide an opportunity for people to ask questions, provide resources. And so that is a goal of ours for this year and something we talked about at the end of last year. We thought it would be a good, a good time to do it during the National Drinking Water Week, which is the first week of May. Um, and that, like I said, we want to cover a, a range of topics for the general community to become more educated. Um, and thinking of some possible venues, we're thinking is maybe the library for an evening meeting. Um, I know Brian mentioned sometimes going to conferences, they have interactive tools or apps that allow people to kind of engage. You can pull the audience, ask questions, um, share information. So uh, looking into seeing if that's a possibility for a forum like this and really um, bringing it up tonight to just put it on the SWAG's radar. Uh, and most importantly, we're, we're looking for a subcommittee of SWAG members to really help us work on the planning, the agenda, the format, and the outreach. So if that's something you're interested in, kind of taking a deeper dive on the planning of this, uh, certainly let Brian and I know. Um, and then also, you know, if you have any ideas in terms of topics um, or good ways to get this uh, forum out to the community so we can get a good turnout of people, that would be great as well. So we can move on to the next subject. Um, well, this slide's a little mixed together, but um, yeah, so the, the other thing we wanted to talk about was one of the first things we did last year when we established our swag was we set some goals, which I think is really helpful to keep us on track and help us plan our meetings. Um, this is a sample of the goals that we had last year, just to give folks an idea of you know, you know, what we accomplished. Most of them we did accomplish, like having an overview of the water system, understanding contaminants of concern. Um, we got a lot of updates on legislation and future legislation. Um, and so I just want to give folks a sense of what we did last year, what we achieved, and what, what's still ongoing. And then if you can go to the next slide, please. Ben. 
just wanted to um, flag some potential goals for this term, which is 2022 and 2023, um, and just see if anyone from the SWAG uh, has any suggestions on goals or if, if these sound okay or anyone has any objections to these goals. So again, obviously completing that drinking water forum uh, that we want to we want to complete in May. Uh, we want to continue to have ongoing legislative updates. We we're very lucky last year to have uh, state representative David Muse and state senator Rebecca Perkins Polka. Uh, we also had a staff member from Senator Shaheen's office come and give us updates. So that was really helpful. Um, something we talked about last year was outreaching private well owners uh, with New Hampshire DES. We don't have a whole lot of private well owners here in Portsmouth. Most people are on city water, but we do have some. And we want to make sure we're outreaching them and providing them with resources so they can routinely test so, their water. So Al um, has been, uh, he and I are, are, are splitting duties to go to the Seacoast uh, Drinking Water Commission. So maybe Al can, in one of the recent meetings is an uh, effort the DES is having in the Seacoast for, the, for that. Maybe we can touch on that real quick. Right, they're trying to find uh, volunteers to be on the committee. So there's a state trying to develop a committee to help with the private well aid. I think that plan two hundred and eighty thousand dollars to do this private well study of the Seacoast region private wells. Uh, there are a lot of wells in Greenland, there are a lot of wells in Newington and Portsmouth combined. So they're trying to find those those sources. They want to find members. They thought the swag would be a good location to get somebody that would want to be involved as a committee member. Uh, but also as a volunteer, because this would be a lot of simple election coordination that the DES is going to help with. Um, David Muse was on the call also, so it would be a good time contact to see if there'd be some interest within the group to get involved in that program. Thank you very much. Um, another potential goal uh, is to have an update on the Copley landfill. Uh, that was a suggestion last year. Uh, from former city councilor Cliff Lazenby. Um, so something we can look into factoring into one of our meetings this year. Continue to monitor emerging contaminants. Again, as Brian mentioned, there's a PFAS that was detected in one tap water sample, and we're going to have additional testing. So certainly keeping track of that. There was mentioned last year of monitoring runoff, uh, you know, of any potential PFAS runoff of the artificial turf. So just keeping an eye on what's going on with that. Um, work with the city staff to establish community resources and education on how to dispose of hazardous and PFAS containing products to prevent additional water contamination in our community. Um, and then work with the school department to provide education to students. You know, I think one perfect example of that was brought up tonight in terms of that EPA certification for lead remediation. I think that's an excellent way we can work with our schools. So um, these were just some ideas of potential goals for this year. Um, and so if anyone has any objections to these, let me know, or if you have any additions, certainly let me know, and Brian as well. And you know, you don't have to do it tonight. You know, this is something that will kind of be evolving over our term, but I just wanted to start giving people an idea of what we're thinking about and, and please let us know if you have any thoughts as well. Um, I, I do have a comment on the, um, the form. Yeah. And what dates were they? Did you have them? Um, well, national, May? yeah, May 1st to the May The first second. week of May. Yeah. First week of May. Okay, that's better. I was going to say the second week of May is budget week for the city council. Right. And a lot of people come to that. Okay. And, um, so just. Yeah, not to conflict. Sure. Conflict yeah. the first week works. Yeah. Great. Um, so with that, any thoughts or reactions or any comments on future meetings and goals? Um, is this sure. a um, and I know because we've talked a lot extensively about the uh, runoff from the artificial turf. I know they did a study by the high school, and they were, were concerned with the runoff from the solar panels, uh, uh, PFAs coming off the solar panels, and then the uh, wetware scrap metal. Those are the two contaminants they thought they were worried about. And that was from the high school because uh, they were testing from runoff from the artificial turf. Uh, that was concern. Um, so I just know that was an update last month. I don't know if solar panels should be it. I mean, that was a surprise to me. I was shocked to hear that runoff, the PFAs are a common sort of runoff from solar panels, um, which is bugging my mind because you know you want to help the environment, but then it's hurting the environment sometimes. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but I just wanted to. Yeah, sure. no, excellent points to raise. Modern technology comes with it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do. I mean, our our phones have a number of uh, all the compounds in them too. You know. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Tim. Uh, the public education is a great idea, um, and this is such a large topic that could it be a series of public courses or public education? Because it seems to make sense that you would first introduce the whole idea of chemicals in our environment and how they got there and how we got into this mess. And that might take a bit of time, and then maybe a couple months later, do the other, you know, the next segment of it and the next segment of it. I think that would be a great public service. And I think I think that's a great suggestion because I think there's a lot of contaminants that we're concerned about and trying to share that in a way that's meaningful to the community but not overwhelming. So I think that's a good good suggestion and one we yeah. should keep in mind. There's no other comments at this time or thoughts or reactions on needs uh, and goals. Um, just the last thing I wanted to put on everyone's radar is that, you know, the plan is to meet quarterly, so four times a year, and, uh, but this year, so we'll plan for four meetings, and in addition to the drinking water forum that will be in May of 2022, and so what Brian and I had kind of potentially mapped out was um, February, which is tonight, April, August, and November, um, and again, just trying to get folks, you know, if, if that sounds doable for folks, and also, uh, trying to find timing. I think last year we ran into kind of scheduling the meetings close. We, I think we want to try to get these scheduled and on the calendar very soon for the rest of the year, just so we're not running into conflicts with yeah, meetings. And that was the challenge last year. It's, so. a, it's a tough matrix uh, to find uh, find and, and place a spot. And we know, you know, everybody uh, on this committee has has got you know a full schedule as is. So we do our best. Um, it seems like the uh, the hybrid meeting is, is helpful in, in getting as many people here as possible still. Um, so what we're gonna do is do our best to just find those dates that don't conflict, certainly with council, we've got a planning board, we have school board, um, those are the biggies. Um, so you know, that's, that's how we're trying to do it. And then also, you know, August, we certainly wouldn't do the first couple of weeks of August because school's still out. So it would probably be you know, later in August and stuff. Try to find those dates that slot in at the right time. And I think you know, having an idea of what of people's other commitments are, I know we talked a little bit before we started, you are quite a few. I know Councilor Blaylock, you are too. So if we kind of have a sense as we set these dates early on, if there's potential conflicts, just please let us know as we try to get these meetings scheduled ahead of time so they're known well in advance. Usually for me, if it's at this hour, you know what I mean, on Wednesday or Thursday, it's usually a, uh, it's just once we run into baseball season, football season. Uh, four to six area gets a little tricky for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think um, with that, does anybody have any closing thoughts or questions or concerns or anything from the meeting, from the swag? Any? Well, I would say that very informative meeting. And I, I really appreciate the presenters on their, their expertise and uh, knowledge. And, uh, I, I just found it fascinating. Thank you. I would just echo that I always appreciate Brian and Andrea's efficiencies. This is, I'm involved in a lot of things. This is one of the most efficient groups for moving the needle, getting things done. And getting <laughs> meetings on time. So I appreciate that. We, we can stand here and chit chat till like the clock says 8.30, it's 8.29 at the moment, but maybe we'll give ourselves a minute break and thank everybody for coming. And I think we just have to do public comment in case there is uh, any I, public I, comment. We have, I, chat, I did check that. We have no public anymore. So okay. I, think, I think that's it. So uh, we're thank at 8.30. Very so efficiently ending a meeting right at time. So thank you. And we'll hope to see everybody in a couple, couple months. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good evening. Yeah.